Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Miller, and I'm the Senior Vice President of the Zoo, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this uh, talk on uh, women and animal behavior. It actually got me to thinking, and for any of you that are considering careers, I just would like to share, I went through our senior staff, and actually all our senior researchers are women. Uh, Cheryl Asa, who has a PhD in reproductive behavior. Our newest PhD is Stephanie Brancini, who just received her PhD in evolutionary psychology from St. Andrews University. Sharon Deem, who's a DVM and a PhD in veterinary epidemiology. Mary Duncan, who's our veterinary pathologist and a PhD in parasitology. Corinne Kozlowski, who's also a new member of the staff, PhD in endocrinology. Of course, Patty Parker, our joint appointment with the University of Missouri St. Louis in ecology and genetics. Deb Schmidt, our PhD nutritionist. Half our veterinary staff is women, and uh, several other of our staff have uh, master's degrees in animal behavior or genetics or related uh, opportunities. So it really made me stop and think that I'm really pleased where the zoo is right now and really pleased to host this meeting this evening. So with that said, thank you very much and uh, I'll let you do the... Uh thank you, Eric. I also wanna just extend a thanks to the zoo staff um, who provided this facility and thank you all for coming tonight on a Monday night tearing yourself away from whatever is on television. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker Dr. Zulema Tang Martinez. Zulema earned her bachelor's degree in biology from St. Louis University, her master's and PhD in zoology from UC Berkeley and she did a post doctorate at the University of British Columbia. She's the editor of Bateman's Principal on Integrated and Comparative Biology. She's also an art of art author and co-author of numerous articles and chapters um, covering topics on sociobiology, gender and behavior in primates, vertebrates, rodents, and voles, with an emphasis on vertebrate social behavior, um, particularly chemical communication and kin discrimination. Most recently, her research has been focused on the behavioral ecology and social behavior of one of my favorite animals, the brown recluse spider, that you may have found accidentally in a wood pile. Um, she, she's also interested in the history of biological determinism in um, human sociobiology, ethical issues in biology, and the development of scientific paradigms. Dr. Tang Martinez has been a professor at UMSL since 1976. During that period, she served as Interim Chair of Biology and Director of Women's Studies, as President of the Anim Animal Behavior Society, and was named Distinguished Minority Sci Sci Scientist at UC Berkeley by the Animal Behavior Society, and received the Exceptional Career Service Award, and most recently was named among the top Hispanics in the United States. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zulema Tang Martinez. Thank you, Sally. The brown recluses actually are in my basement, not in a wood pile. They're much closer than that. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, because this is Women's History Month, is uh, the impact that women have had in the field of animal behavior, which of course is my own field. And if we look at um, science as a scientific process, there are several different perspectives that different people have. So some people have argued that science is socially neutral, it doesn't matter who the scientists are, that science is science and that gender or race or ethnicity make no difference at all whatsoever in the uh, practice or process of science. And on the other hand, you have people who say, well, that's not quite correct, that in fact women and minorities can bring different perspectives to science and they can uh, impact science in that way. Um, and so if we, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on women, although some of these comments could be just as easily made about ethnic and racial minorities. So um, we can ask why would women make a difference? And I think that women can bring to science different life experiences, 
different interests, um, a different social milieu in the, in the practice in the community of science, and because women have tended to be, until fairly recently in animal behavior, uh, outsiders, they tend to come into the field uncontaminated by dogma, so they're not um, sort of constrained by uh, the dogma in the field. And if we look at the scientific method, I think that there are several places where women can have an impact. So the scientific method involves the, generate, uh, the generation of questions and hypotheses, uh, designing tests for those hypotheses, then collecting and analyzing the data, and then lastly, interpreting the data. And I think that the two that are starred, the generating questions and hypotheses and interpreting the data, are the two areas in which um, uh, women and minorities and everybody actually uh, can have an impact. Um, and I want to emphasize interpreting the data. I don't know how many of you here are scientists and how many are just interested non-scientists, but there is a common misconception that data equals um, interpretation or that you get your, your data and that's the end of it, those are the results. But in reality, you can have exactly the, dame, the same data set and you can have different people look at that data and come up with radically different interpretations. And I think we'll see some examples of this as we go on. Now, I entitled this talk, uh, Sh Women Shifting Paradigms in Animal Behavior. And so I wanna say a little bit about what I mean by paradigms. Um, a paradigm in the sense of Thomas Kuhn, who is a philosopher of science, is a widely accepted worldview that provides a guide for interpreting reality. And that's not a direct quote from Kuhn, but it's sort of my interpretation of what Kuhn means by paradigm. And there are some things, in, uh, in with regards to science, there are some things that are extremely positive about the existence of paradigms, including the fact that paradigms provide a common framework and a language, a common language for the scientific community. So without paradigms, it would become very difficult to even be able to communicate with one another if we're all talking um, in, you know, like past each other. So the, the fact that there are paradigms, there are accepted ideas in the field, there are essentially dogmas, that makes communication easier. On the other hand, there are also certain problems that arise because of the, um, because of paradigms. And this include oversimplification of original results so that it becomes very easy to look at your results and interpret them within that existing paradigm and you don't look outside of that paradigm for other, possibles, other possible interpretations. Paradigms can act as blinders that prevent or interfere with other interpretations of reality. And paradigms, I would argue, can restrict the imagination because you don't have the ability to go outside of that paradigm and imagine different perspectives or different explanations. And so I have a couple of um, slides, more than a couple, several slides, that um, I want to use to sort of illustrate what I mean by paradigm. So for those of you who might be um, amateur astronomers, you will immediately recognize that this diagram that I have here represents the stars in the constellation Gemini, in the constellation the twins. And of course, if you're interested in astronomy from day one, from the time you were a little kid, you learn to recognize that this is Gemini the twins. And this is what Gemini looks like. If you draw the lines and connect the stars, you get the twins. And I would say that this is the existing paradigm. But is there an alternative? Okay, do we have to stay with that paradigm or can we step outside of the paradigm and imagine something different? And yes, there is an alternative. So you can collect, connect those same stars in a totally different way that then allows you to see an antelope with maybe an arrow coming towards it. And so I think this helps to give you a perspective of what it is that I mean by paradigms here. And I have also suggested that uh, living in a paradigm is like living inside a box, as you see my little stick figure here. 
living inside a box, and the only thing that you can see when you're inside that box is what's inside the box. So there can be a whole world outside that you're not even aware of because you can't look outside. And so that is what I mean when I say that paradigms can be confining, they can restrict the imagination. So having said that about paradigms, I now want to talk about some of the traditional, what I would call old paradigms in animal behavior that really um, existed right up until about the 1970s or so. And in some cases, to some extent, they continue to exist. So the first one that I want to consider is paradigms that had to do with primate behavior, the behavior of monkeys and apes. And the major paradigm at the time was the, had to do with male roles. Males were the center of societies, of primate societies, and what uh, governed primate societies was aggression and dominance, aggression and dominance by the males. Secondly, if we look at paradigms that existed around social groups, the idea, again, was that the groups were male-centered. Oftentimes, these groups were called harems. And of course, with harem comes the notion that the male, you have one male that's in control of a group of females, and the females do the bidding of the male. The females are um, subor subordinate to the male, and so on. Uh, a third um, area has to do with extra pair copulations and promiscuity. And when I say extra pair copulations, I mean situations where you have a male and a female that are paired socially. That is, they stay together, they may build a nest together, they raise their young together, but one or the other is engaging in copulations with other, um, other individuals outside of that pair. Um, and so, and this of course can, in extreme cases, result in what in animal behavior we call promiscuity. And this was seen as a male strategy. The males benefited from this, the males initiated this behavior. And then lastly, uh, in terms of sexual selection, sexual selection predicted stereotyped male and female sexual behaviors and sexual roles. Now, I should say that I've only selected this four. There could have been others. And in fact, in a longer version of this talk, I include some other things. But for tonight, I'm limiting uh, what I'm going to say to these four areas, in part because I think that is, they're very, very clear to see uh, what the change is that has occurred. So again, looking more detail at uh, primate behavior, and the role of males in dominance and aggression. Most of the studies that led to that paradigm were captive studies. They were done in zoos or in other types of situations where the animals could not get away from an aggressor. And so you tended to see very high levels of aggression and you tended to see very uh, rigid dominance hierarchies, particularly among the males. At that point, few um, species had been studied in the field and I'm sure you all know that Jane Goodall was one of the first people to go out and actually study primates in the field. And because of this emphasis on aggression and dominance, baboons became the model for what all primates were supposed to be like. So we have the baboon model of um, primate behavior with primates being seen as male-centered societies with very high levels of male aggression. And to illustrate that paradigm, uh, we have a quote from um, Hall and DeVore from 1965. And what they say is that the main characteristic of baboon social organization are derived from a complex dominance pattern among adult males that usually ensure stability and comparative peacefulness within the group. So what they are saying here is that the males are the ones that, uh, through their dominance, are essentially shaping the group and are um, maintaining order, actually, by this very, very high levels of aggression and dominance. Now, beginning in 1982, we began to see a, what I call a paradigm shift. 
things begin to change. And one of the people that was particularly important in this was Linda Fedigan. She is an anthropologist, and by the way, I am including in this discussion of animal behavior, anthropology when it has to do with behavior. So, and typically, uh, anthropologists who study behavior of primates will also consider themselves animal behaviorists and be part of the Animal Behavior Society, and so on. So Linda Fedigan, in 1982, published a book called Primate Paradigms, um, in which she challenged a large number of the existing ideas on primates and said, we have to start looking uh, at things um, differently. She, for example, criticized the emphasis on males in primate studies up until that point. She criticized the emphasis on aggression and dominance, what she called the baboonization of primates and humans, because what was found in, in primates in the baboon model was also applied to humans, and it was assumed that human behavior was also governed by the same rules as governed baboons. And she called for a more balanced treatment of sex roles. And this is an absolutely wonderful book. I still go back to it every so often and reread parts of it because she does a wonderful job of debunking a lot of the ideas that had existed up until that time. A second person, uh, roughly the same time, that also was absolutely critical, and in fact, she just won the um, uh, she knows it, so it's not a surprise anymore. It was for a while. She just won the Animal Behavior Society's Distinguished Animal Behaviorist Award, which is the highest award that the Animal Society gives for lifetime achievement. So Jean Altman worked with baboons, um, interestingly. She worked in Kenya, and she continues to work in Kenya, but she went out and she started looking at very different types of behavior. So instead of looking at um, aggression and dominance, what she looked at instead was interactions within the social groups. And what she realized is that, I don't know if you can see this, but her book um, from 1982, Baboon Mothers and Infants, that was her emphasis. And she began to realize that the group actually was very organized around mothers and their infants, rather than around this male dominance and aggression. And needless to say, this was a huge paradigm shift in terms of how we looked at uh, primate behavior. From the 1980s to the present, we have continued to have a very large number of women in, um, in primatology, behavioral primatology, and I just have a sampling here, and I'm going to mention the, some of the titles of the books, and then I'll, in the next slide, I'll give you a little bit more about the individual women. So we have Sarah Hurdy who wrote The Woman That Never Evolved, and what Sarah said essentially is that evolutionary biologists had acted as if it was only men that evolved and the women were like the tail and the dog that just got dragged along. And so this was her critique. Um, some of them I can't see from here actually. Sex and friendship in baboons, okay? Barbara Smuts, again, a totally different approach. Uh, the evolving female, and so on. And some of these people here you will recognize primarily Jane Goodall, of course, with the chimps. But all of these women were extremely influential. Um, now, some of these pioneers that I just showed you, because I didn't have room in the previous slide, Thelma Rowell questioned dominance hierarchies altogether and baboon stereotypes and generalizations. She pointed out that if you look at baboons in captive studies as had been done, pretty much until the time she started looking at them in Kenya again, what you saw was high levels of aggression and very rigid dominance hierarchies. But when she looked at exactly the same species of baboon in the field, what she discovered is that um, if the baboons were in a situation where they could move around and get away, that dominance hierarchies were much more fluid, that there wasn't that rigidity, and that you didn't have those very, very high levels of aggression that you saw in, uh, in captive situations. Sarah Hurdy, as I already mentioned, um, criticized evolutionary theorists' focus on men as being the men that evolved, which is why she called her book The Woman That Never Evolved, um, and also criticized 
existing perspectives on male and female sex roles. And again, some of this work was exclusively with non-human primates, but in other cases, such as in Sarah Hardy's, she also applied it to humans. Uh, Karen Stryer has done a lot of work and continues to do work on the role of mothers and grandmothers as, again, organizing um, uh, relationships in primate groups. Shirley Strum um, has done a lot of work on the role of gender in society, again, using studies on primates to try to understand human society from a different perspective. And I already mentioned Barbara Smuts, the role of friendships. And also, she has done some very interesting work on female dominance in primate groups. And so, if we look at female dominance in primates, what Barbara Smuts was able to do by doing a meta-analysis, which is a study of all the various studies that already existed on uh, many different species of primates, was that there are different, that, that different levels of sexual dimorphism, that is how different males and females are, influences who is dominant within a group, within a primate group or species. So that in those species where females are larger than males, then the females are dominant. And this includes, for example, certain lemurs, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, when the females are the same size as, as, as the males, then in those cases, females will tend to be co-dominant. So the males may have a dominance hierarchy, and the females will have their own dominance hierarchy. And at the top, there's no difference between the male and the female, so they're co-dominant. When females are somewhat smaller than males, then typically what you tend to see is that females will form coalitions with other females, and as a coalition, they're able to dominate the males. And it is only in those species in which the males are much larger than females that the males are clearly dominant to the females, and uh, females are very subordinate to the males. So a much more nuanced view of what's involved. Now, in terms of social groups, I mentioned that the existing paradigm uh, was the harem, and again, meaning that social groups are composed of a dominant male, which controls a group of females for his benefit. Um, and when we say for his benefit, this was usually in terms of mating and reproduction. So males were the focus, and they were the organizing principle, the core of social groups. Gail Missioner, uh, originally from Australia, but now at the University of Lethbridge in Canada, um, in studying uh, several different species of ground squirrels, came up with a totally different model, which now we know is applicable to the vast majority of mammalian species that are social. And what Gail found was that social groups most commonly are composed of core groups of related females, so that the core permanent aspect of a social group is a group of related females with, me, with males only coming in and being temporarily associated with those groups of females. So that males will come in, they might stay depending on the species for a year or two years and then they leave and a new male comes in. And those new males coming in have to be accepted by the females. The females can reject those males. And um, uh, Gail then uh, pioneered the use of the term female kin cluster or matriarchies in, in referring to the core of these uh, social groups that we see. As I mentioned, these uh, female kin clusters are quite common and in the vast majority of at least mammalian social species that we know of, the core of the group does seem to be uh, the female groups, usually related females. So that if we look at spotted hyenas, um, once again, spotted hyenas are best understood as matriarchies, with the females forming, once again, the core of the social group. They, the females are completely dominant uh, to the males, and even young little females are amazing in their dominance of very large males who are terrified of them. Some of you may actually have seen uh, Kay Holacamp because Kay Holacamp started here at the St. Louis Zoo. She's from St. Louis originally, and she started 
uh, just as a volunteer at the zoo and then went on to Berkeley and is now at the University of Michigan. And so she comes back to St. Louis fairly often and she on several occasions has given talks here at the zoo. And she has these beautiful videos of this little tiny hyena female chasing this great big male and the male's got his tail between his legs and he's just running away. But um, so that, as I said, even young females dominate adult males. And there is what is called maternal rank inheritance, which is also found in some primates. Maternal rank inheritance means that the daughters inherit the rank of their mother. So if the mother is a beta female, number two in the hierarchy, then her daughter will be right under her and dominant to everybody else. So dominance is important, but in this case, it is the females that are dominant. And the two people who have done much of this work are Kay Holacamp and Laura Smell. <clears throat> and I'll be referring to them briefly later on as well. Now, there are some groups, again, that were called harems for a very long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And some people even today will call them harems. And these are one male primate groups. So this is a group of females with one male. So traditionally, harems um, meant that the male dominates and controls the females for reproduction, as I mentioned before. And so this is a very male-centered perspective. Jane Lancaster, who is a very well-known woman primatologist, um, sort of turned things on its head by saying, for a female, males are a resource which she may use to further the survival of herself and her offspring. Only one male is necessary for a group of females if its only role is to impregnate them. And so instead of now seeing the male as the center, Jane says, look, the females only need one male, so they're only accepting one male. And so that's why you have this one male group. So again, a very different perspective from the traditional perspective. So now I'm going to go to extra pair copulations, which I defined for you early, earlier. Uh, we generally refer to them in shorthand EPCs. That means extra pair copulations. EPFs are extra pair fertilizations because, of course, you can have a copulation without having fertilization. And so if you can demonstrate that, in fact, uh, there is fertilization, then you refer to them as EPFs. Okay? Um, you can also have extra pair offspring. There's a whole lot of little EP uh, uh, codes that we use. So if we look at the history, um, for a very long time, and much less so today, but still we're not totally rid of this idea, um, the accepted dogma was that females are sexually passive and generally uninterested in sex, that they're very choosy, they prefer monogamy, so given a choice, females will always be monogamous, and that they will mate with only one male, presumably the best male that she can find, and they will stay on their mate's territory. Um, and much of this, of course, comes from the Victorian era. And so many of these ideas that I just mentioned are ideas that come directly from Darwin. Okay, Darwin, of course, was working in a particular social context, the Victorian era in which women were, you know, if women showed any interest in sex, they were considered to be sick and abnormal, and so on, okay? And this then was carried down through a series of other um, scientists who essentially took Darwin's ideas and ran with them. Then in 1975, something very interesting happened because there was a study that was being done on a bird, red-winged blackbirds, and um, the study didn't have anything to do with EPCs. Nobody even knew that EPCs occurred at that time because you don't see them very often, if at all. And so part of the study involved vasectomizing half of the males that were in this group of territories with males, you know, paired males and females, so you had half of the males being vasectomized, and lo and behold, the females uh, that were in that male's territory had young, uh, very normally. And so clearly, that was the first clue that something strange, quote unquote strange, was going on because their mates were not capable of having fertilized them. 
Uh, and so obviously they had to be mating with someone else in order to, to be having young. Um, in 1984, DNA paternity analysis showed without doubt that um, you had so presumably monogamous females, females that had always, in species that had always considered to be monogamous, where one male and one female come together, build their nest, raise their young together. Um, so you had monogamous females that were producing offspring with more than one father. And one of the people that was very influen influential in this was Patty Bowati, whom you'll again hear about in a bit. Uh, in 1988, because nobody could actually see this extra pair copulation, Susan Smith decided that she and her uh, collaborators were going to watch um, this one species of sparrow around the clock because they knew that they were having extra pair copulations and they were having young that were sired by males other than the, than the paired male. Um, but they never saw any of these copulations, and so they watched them around the clock, and they discovered that in the early morning hours, the females would quietly leave their own territory, go to neighboring territories, solicit males, the males would leave their nest, come over, mate with them, and then they'd go back to their respective, um, to their respective uh, territories and social mates. And what's interesting is that now it is widely accepted and widely recognized that in the sector pair copulations, it is the females that are taking the lead in most cases in soliciting those copulations. So who benefits? Um, the initial assumption when extra pair copulations were first discovered was that the males were raping the females because the females were not supposed to be interested in sex, right? They're, they want to be monogamous, and so if they were having an extra pair young, then the explanation was that the males were raping the females and the females were being forced to copulate. And this obviously was seen as a male reproductive strategy. The males could produce more offspring who would carry their genes. Then as the amount of extra pair copulations and extra pair fertilizations um, became greater and greater as more and more species were discovered and you know at this point in time it is rare to find a species that doesn't have extra pair copulations and fertilizations then the assumption and both of this by the way were mostly males who were making this argument was that the females the males were coming over and they were harassing the females they weren't exactly raping them per se but they were harassing them so much that the females finally said, okay, what the hell, you know, I'll go ahead and mate with you. And again, this was very much seen as a male reproductive strategy. And again, in a bit, you'll see some more modern, you, you'll see that some of these ideas die hard, essentially. But currently, as I already said, females, we know that fem females actively solicit copulations from non-pair males. They can do so in their own territory when their mate is away or they can go over into other males' territories. And so now, extra pair copulations are very much seen as a female reproductive strategy. So much so that, oops, I'm sorry, before I get to so much so. So, so what I just said before, okay, myths die hard. So back in 1976, you have Hoagland and Sherman saying it is often selectively advantageous for a male to copulate with an individual other than its mate, but only under special circumstances for females to do the same, okay? And so here again, this is being seen as a male reproductive strategy and it is being assumed that it is the males that are taking the lead in this and that the females rarely would engage in such behavior. But here we are, 2005, Okay, however many years later, and I'm reading a book that I was using for a seminar, a graduate seminar, a couple of semesters ago, and I find this quote. The benefits of multiple mating to males are typically obvious. More mating, more offspring. Resistance by females suggests that mating carries significant costs to females that are not compensated for by any benefits that comes with mating. And so, here we, ha here we are, 2005, okay, at a time when I would have expected that everybody would know better than to make a statement like this, and we have um, 
two individuals in a, in, a, in a book, essentially making that very, very same argument. So myths do die hard. So our current understanding, um, and the person probably primarily responsible for, for the information on this slide is Patty Gowati, who was at the University of Georgia and is now at the University of California in Los Angeles. Current understanding is that extra pair copulations and extra pair fertilizations are rampant. In some species, 75% of all the young that are sired are sired by males other than the social mate, 75%, which means that the, the um, putative mate, the putative paired mate, is only siring 25% of the young. Um, this has resulted, this is so rampant, that it has resulted in a complete reclassification of mating systems, talk about changing paradigms, shifting paradigms, so that now we can no longer talk about mating systems the way we used to, where we would talk about monogamy, uh, polygamy, promiscuity, and it was all very nice and clear and simple. Now we have to, if we're gonna talk about monogamy, for example, we have to talk about social monogamy and we have versus genetic monogamy. Social monogamy is what I have been describing. You have a male and a female, they get together, they stay together, they court each other, they raise young, build nests together, and so on, okay? That's social monogamy. But you can have socially monogamous pairs that are not genetic monog monog genetically monogamous because genetic monogamy means that they truly only mate with one another, okay? That they're not mating with other individuals. We now know that genetic monogamy is extremely rare. There are some species that up until now do really appear to be genetic monog genetically monogamous, but lots and lots of species are socially monogamous, but genetically promiscuous or polyandrous. Um, we also, thanks to Patty's work, we know that male, male mate guarding tactics in many species are completely ineffective, so that males may try to follow females around to keep them from mating with other males, but it doesn't seem to work very well. And there's now lots and lots of attention to how females benefit. So that now, extra pair copulations are more like, and extra pair fertilizations are more likely to be seen as a female reproductive strategy. And I don't have time to go through this, but there is a whole series of hypotheses for how females benefit, including, for example, that by mating with extra pair males, females are ensuring that all of their eggs will be fertilized in case their mate, for example, is sterile, infertile, uh, that she's getting good genes for her offspring, that there, she is increasing the genetic variability of her offspring, which in changing environments or unstable environments is a good thing. You wanna have a lot of variability so at least some of the young you produce survive and so on, and I'm not going to go through all of them because, you know, it's too much. I don't have the time. In terms of sexual selection and male and female roles, again, one of the people who has been extremely important in this is Patty Gowati. The other person is yours truly. Um, and Patty and I make this nice team, as some of my students who are here know, where we, you know, go back and forth on this stuff. And so, essentially, um, what Patty and I have done using very different approaches is to challenge those ideas that I uh, earlier attributed to Darwin, but that were also picked up by other individuals that we're not going to talk about here, Bateman, Trivers, and so on. And it is this paradigm of females being passive and not interested in sex and males and, and monogamous and uh, males being promiscuous and always wanting more sex with more females, the more the better, and so on. Um, and so what Patty in particular has emphasized is um, plastic sex roles, that in fact there are situations in which you, you can have choosy males and you can have sexually active females, and females that will compete with each other over males, which was unheard of and unimaginable uh, 
in an earlier age. And essentially, that females are much more in control of their own reproduction than had been believed. Um, also with regard to sexual selection, um, I'm going to give you another example of a completely paradigm shifting um, uh, discovery by a woman named Kathy Cox. Um, in elephant seals, the traditional view is that males compete for females and females always accept the winner. And this is one of the ways in which sexual selection is supposed to operate. Okay, male-male competition, males fight it out and whoever wins gets the female and the female has no say in it. So if any of you watch nature programs, you've seen bighorn sheep, you know, coming at each other and budding horns or elk fighting. And in all of those cases, the idea is that the males fight, the female accepts whichever male wins. The elephant seals, in part because the males are huge and the females are very small, and so a female has no chance whatsoever of actually fighting off a male that mounts her. Elephant seals were used as a quintessential example of male-male competition, okay, without any female choice whatsoever, the way that I just described. Again, males can totally overpower females. So the assumption was that males in harems had complete control over the females that they wanted to mate with. And the only thing that interfered with who they made it with was if another male came along and you had to fight it out and whoever won got the female. So Kathy Cox, um, back, uh, if I remember correctly, in the 1970s, um, when she was working on her PhD dissertation on elephant seals, discovered that if an unwanted male, for example, a young male or a subordinate male, mounts a female, the female will begin screaming her head off. And she'll scream and scream. And what that does is that it attracts other males. They hear the screaming, other males come. Other males will then challenge the male that has mounted the female. They will knock him off the female, and they'll fight. Okay? So whichever male wins, will then mount the female. If the female is unhappy with that male, she'll again begin screaming. And so consequently, what you get is a series of male fights until a dominant male that is acceptable to the female finally mounts the female, and at that point, the female no longer screams. Okay, so the female quietly accepts that male. And this then was called by Kathy Cox, indirect female choice by female incitement of male-male competition. Okay? Again, it completely reverses what is going on. The females cannot actively choose males because any male can overpower a female. But indirectly, by her behavior, the female can have a lot of say as to which male actually get, gets to mate with her. Okay? So she is indirectly choosing which male mates with her. And indirect female choice is now widely recognized and researched, and there are many, many examples which now have, in, have been interpreted as indirect female choice. So many, actually, that even I, at times, have problems and say, well, you know, I'm not sure that's really indirect female choice. But nonetheless, this is what started it all. Now, there have also been men, I don't want to um, give you the impression that it's only women. There have also been men that have um, questioned uh, sexual stereotypes, sex role stereotypes. And I'm just featuring three of them here, and I'll have a couple more in the next slide. Bob Sussman, who's at Washington University. And what I find interesting is that Bob works with lemurs. And as I already mentioned earlier, in lemurs, Females are dominant to the males, okay? Um, if you look at Chuck Snowden at the University of Wisconsin, he works with tamarins in which males and females are co-dominant. And there are certain situations in which the dominant female will be dominant to everybody, including the dominant male. 
Steve Glickman, who was my advisor um, at the University of California at Berkeley, studied spotted hyena. And as you already heard, spotted hyena females are dominant to all the males. And moreover, the spotted hyenas have masculinized genitals. So that female spotted hyenas have a penis that is almost impossible, unless you're in the know, to distinguish from a male penis. They mate through the penis, they give birth through the penis, which always makes guys feel very, very uncomfortable. Um, but I think that the fact that that all of these individuals worked with species that did not fit those stereotypes allowed them to look beyond that box, to say, whoa, you know, my guys don't fit into this. And I think that's part of the reason that they have been able to challenge stereotypes much more broadly than just their own species. The other thing that I find very interesting is that all of these three individuals are particularly well known for having produced women uh, animal behaviorists who in turn have gone on to challenge paradigms. Just in Steve's example, um, I mentioned that he was my advisor at Berkeley. He was also the advisor for Kay Hola Camp and Laura Smale, whom I mentioned earlier. Okay. And there have been other individuals that in one way or another have either questioned sexist assumptions or have highlighted the importance of looking at females or have championed female inclusion in science. And I just have a few examples here. Uh, Bill Everhard actually wrote an extremely important book um, that, again, completely tended to shift paradigms, called it Female Control, Sexual Selection by Cryptic Female Choice, that is female choice that is not obvious. Um, so we have Bill Everhard. One interesting thing is that some of these men are explicitly um, feminist. So, for example, Scott Gilbert, who actually is not an animal behaviorist, is actually a developmental bi biologist. He's at Swarthmore, but he has written, he publishes a great deal in feminist, um, feminist journals, and he, um, uh, some of his work has applications to animal behavior, which is why I'm including him here. He very strongly identifies as a feminist and has a feminist study group and so on. Other individuals, not necessarily so. So for example, Don Dewsbury, who clearly from his writings is very aware of the feminist literature on science, I've never heard him say I'm a feminist. But from his writings, you can tell that he's absorbed some of the feminist critiques and so on, and also that he then applies that work to his own, to his own research. So a basic question that we can go back to is, um, do women in science actually make a difference? And this is a hotly contested um, question, as you can imagine. There are many different views. Some people would say, no, it's not women per se, men too, and I've showed you some examples of this. And rather, it is feminism and a feminist approach. But how do we define feminism? because there's many, many different uh, definitions of feminism, and I consider myself a feminist, but there are other feminists that I would have very, very strong disagreements with. So I think this is perhaps an oversimplification. Moreover, some of the individuals that I have talked to you about consider themselves feminists, but others don't. And so I think this is too simplistic. Some people say, look, it doesn't have anything to do with gender, it's interesting women, and for that matter, interesting men, asking interesting questions and doing interesting science and getting interesting results, so let's stop talking about gender, okay? That's one view. Some will say it's not just women, it's all excluded and mar marginalized groups. So at the beginning, I talked about the fact that I could give this talk and also accept that they haven't been, <laughs> the inclusion hasn't been the same um, for racial and ethnic minorities or for that matter, disabled people, um, or people from different religious perspectives. Um, and then there are people who say women as such absolutely do make a difference, and they have a different way of looking at the world, and they have a different way of uh, different interests and different ways of doing science. So this drastically different views, to give you some examples, 
Evelyn Fox Keller, a very strong feminist, says that the question is meaningless and harmful and that it stereotypes women, that it's actually the wrong thing to be asking and that it contributes to the exclusion of women, uh, of women from science. Because she says that if you start saying, well, me, women are different from men, then immediately that sets up a dichotomy and in the end that's going to be hurtful to women in the sciences. On the other hand, my friend Sue Rosser says, of course women have a different way of doing science. Women's ways of thinking and knowing influence all aspects of the process of science. And those four uh, examples that I gave you, the developing hypotheses, testing hypotheses, and so on, um, where I highlighted two that I thought were the two places where women were most likely to have an effect or other underrepresented groups, Sir Rosser wouldn't even highlight those two. She says the whole thing, women are going to do science differently all across the board. And then you have people like Alison Jolly, who is sort of the mother earth of women primatology, who says, this is revisionary history. She claims that, in fact, what I told you about primatology before the 1970s, that in fact, males at the time were doing science in exactly the same way as women were, and that men were asking women relevant questions way, way back. And she gets very, very upset about this type of talk or this type of discussion. So one thing that I think is important to ask is, is it animal behavior per se? Because the reality is, and I have thought a lot about this, I look at other fields of science and I have a very difficult time. Um, in some cases it's not as difficult, but in many cases it's very, very difficult to see how a female perspective would result in a different chemistry, for example, okay? And so, um, so I've asked, is it animal behavior? And if it is animal behavior per se, then what is it about animal behavior? And I decided to try to tackle this by looking at the history of the field of animal behavior in the United States. So the Animal Behavior Society, which is the Society for the Americas, plural, um, was founded in 1964. There was one woman among the founders, and that's Elsie Colias, whom you see here with her husband, Nick, who was also a founder. So she was the only one, the only woman among the founders. In the initial membership in the early years of the Animal Behavior Society, only 8% of the members were women. So it's a tiny, tiny number of women. Currently, look at how things have changed, Currently, approximately 50.6% of members are women, members of the Animal Behavior Society. Since 1983, there have been 12 women presidents, which comes out to almost every other year you have a woman. But to be fair, we still have some problems in some areas in terms of inclusion. So just to give you an idea of the Presidents, women presidents of the Animal Behavior Society. Uh, some of this you've already seen, such as Gene Altman, you've seen Gail Mishner, Sulema Tang Martinez, Patty Gowadi, but these are all the presidents of the Animal Behavior Society since 1983. Our current past president is Susan Foster, um, and our current past president is Joan Strassman, who is now at Washington University. And certainly, at this point in time, in the Animal Behavior Society, you know, it used to be early on that we would say, ah, you know, there's a woman and a man, let's vote for the woman. Okay, that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, I look at the candidates and decide based on lots of different issues who I'm gonna vote for. So, why the Animal Behavior Society? Um, the Animal Behavior Society, from its very founding, even though it had this tiny, tiny percentage of women, um, showed a very strong commitment to a non-hierarchical structure. And at the time, this was more in terms of students. So students in the society were given exactly the same rights as anybody else, which is highly, highly unusual for a scientific society. There was no obvious good old boys network that ran the society. In fact, one of the things that we're very proud of is that if the society comes up with 
two nominations for president and five members of the society, students, whoever, okay, can come up with another nominee, then they can nom that person will be accepted as a nominee. So all you need is five members in a society of over 2,500 people to say we want to nominate, you know, Janet Solak for president, okay? Then Janet Solak goes on that slate just like everybody else. And in fact, the first time that Gene Altman got elected to office, which was editor of the journal, she was still a finishing graduate student but had had many, many years of experience. It was five graduate students who nominated her and she won the election. Um, there seems to be a commitment to science as science. And once women began entering the field, they felt more acceptance and more respect at the Animal Behavior Society than in the vast majority of other scientific societies. I'm an example of that. I first went to the, society, to the American Society of Mammalogy. That was my first conference. And I was appalled by the way that women were looked at, treated, et cetera. And I thought, well, I'll try the Animal Behavior Society. Maybe you'll, I'll have better luck. And the Animal Behavior Society was just wonderful. And I'm not the only one. I have had many, many women tell me that they had exactly the same experiences. They went to one society, did not like the dynamics, and went to animal behavior, and it was like, you know, we loved it. Women members, despite what I just said, women members nonetheless vocally spoke out against sexism when it did occur. And I particularly remember a situation where we had a keynote speaker who was a, um, somebody from Europe. And he got up there and he put up a slide that showed a woman with you know, big breasts and it was very prurient. And the women in the audience, if they were near the, the ends of the rows, got up and turned their back and walked out, made it very, very obvious. And those of us who were in the middle who could not walk out, we got up and turned our back to the speaker until he went on. There were discussions at the time. You know, there, I, another incident that I remember was a graduate student who again had a very sexist slide. Some of the women who were in his talk were very upset. We talked to the leadership of the society. The leadership pulled this guy aside and talked to him about the fact that that was not acceptable. So it wasn't just that the society was you know, wonderful from the beginning. I think it had many, many wonderful things, but I think that women also very actively fought and reacted against those few instances of sexism that did arise every so often. And one thing I have to say is that everything I have told you, all of this wonderful inclusion of women in animal behavior in the US and the impact we have had, is simply not true for other animal behavior societies from other countries. Specifically, I'm thinking of Europe, where just a few years ago there was a huge brouhaha at an international meeting because of the way that women were treated. There were no women speakers, keynote speakers, women were sort of treated as trivial and so on. And many of the women, American women who went to that meeting came back and caucused to talk about what had happened and why and what could be done to keep it from happening. So there seems to be something really different about the Animal Behavior Society and animal behavior in the United States. Oh yeah, this is what I was just telling you about. Um, so how does the presence of women, in terms of what I have told you, and this is sort of wrap up, how does it affect the field? I think that different questions get asked and, different and there are different interpretations of data that already existed, different ways of looking at the data. And as I've already said frequently, this is now, especially now, happening by both sexes. Um, the presence of women allows for more open discussions of gender and minority issues. Um, I already gave you some examples of that. And even most men in the field, and by the field I'm really talking about the Animal Behavior Society, 
are now very, to at least, somewhat sensitized to this issue. A the ABS appears to be committed to inclusion at all levels. We are right now working. Um, in fact, we just submitted a huge grant to the National Science Foundation for broadening participation by minorities and biracial and ethnic minorities and other underrepresented groups and in, in the society and into the field of animal behavior, so greater inclusion. And also, the fact that we have so many women in animal behavior now means that women can serve as role models and as mentors to the younger women, and oftentimes even to one another, because I think that, all, that oftentimes is forgotten, that even established women in the field need the support of other women at times. As I've already said, uh, mentioned earlier, I'm not really sure how all of this translates or even if it does translate to other fields of science. I think it's a good question. Uh, to me, it's not immediately clear. There are other fields such as developmental biology and cell biology in which women have had a pretty big impact and affected certain ideas as well. Um, and the suggestion is, is that women as initial outsider can see things differently. They can think outside the box. Some, as I have already said, have argued that women do science differently and that they approach methodology uh, differently, leading to different insights. And with that, I just have acknowledgments. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, Sally. Um, no, I don't think so. Not, not, in our, not in our journal, which is the Journal of Animal Behavior. Um, also, at least some of the women initially published their results in books, or published their ideas in books, and I also think that helped to pave the way. I mean, which is not to say, even now, there are certain ideas, there's still a lot of resistance to new ideas. For example, in sexual selection, there are some papers that are notoriously more difficult to get published because they go against the accepted norm. But I don't think that there was any, um, you know, deliberate conscious attempt to, to not publish uh, women. I mean, anytime somebody comes up with something that's really new and different and doesn't match with the existing ideas, there's going to be more scrutiny, and I'm sure that happened. But the other thing, I mean, Jean Altman, for example, her work is so excellent that it would be hard for anybody to, to look at one of her papers, to look at her research and find fault with it, because it's very meticulous, very rigorous. Any other questions? If there are questions in the back, I can't see. So do any of you have any thoughts about this? Maybe I should pick on my students. <laughs> yeah, Janet. Yeah, for, Janet was my student many, many, many years ago, like in the 1970s, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, okay. Okay. And she showed up by surprise. She asked me if I remembered her. <laughs> I've been to Capitol Hill many times. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole issue of female control of reproduction is a real biggie, actually. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, is, that is a really, really good point. And it has some real ethical issues as well. Um, because one of the things that, that often happens is that, and, and I consider this very poor science, um, is that you will have somebody uh, who will look at a particular behavior in animals 
and interpret it and decide, oh, well, gee, this looks so much like what humans do. And so they will assume that the behavior in humans evolved in the same way, that it's exactly the same behavior. Rape is probably the best example, okay? And, and then they, use the, they even use the term rape, which is a human term with lots of baggage around it for the animal behavior. And so there's this very facile back and forth between animals and humans. And oftentimes, uh, the, the social and ethical implications of that are horrendous. And I have been very opposed to that to that sort of blurring the boundaries, which is not to say, I mean, humans evolved. Certainly, there are human behaviors that we can get insights into from animal behavior, but I don't think it's that, that simple equation where you go back and forth. I think it's very, very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know, I always I always tell my students that scientists are humans. And as human scientists are affected by their society, they're affected by everything around them. And just, you know, we can think back on, on Darwin and talk about the fact that he was affected in his views by Victorian society, which is not to say that he was wrong about everything he said, but certainly some aspects of what he said, it's very clear that there was an impact from the society, the, the social milieu that he lived in. But it doesn't stop with Darwin, it also occurs today. And the issue today is that many of us are not even aware of how our society may be, unless we stop to think about it, may be impacting our own views and so on. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole area that I didn't talk about, which is the battle of the sexes. And, and I really, huh? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and I really wonder how much this emphasis by some people on the battle of the sexes has to do with the, you know, the modern feminist movement and the fact that women, you know, demanded their rights and so on. And so, and, and I'm not sure that the battle of the sexes is the best way to look at a lot of the behavior that they're calling or that they're including in this battle of the sexes. So. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, Don. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's exactly the kind, of, um, the kind of situation and the sorts of attitudes that existed in the past. And when I mentioned that many of us went to other professional meetings before trying the Animal Behavior Society and we were appalled, it's exactly that same sort of uh, situation. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and I think also that, you know, oftentimes, um, I mean, many of us, including young women today, um, live in a very different society than what I grew up in. And I think oftentimes, because of what has gone on in the past, I think young people tend to forget what, um, what things were like 
before, and so oftentimes there's a lot of surprise when things like this happen because you, you think that all those f battles have been fought and, you know, and I mean, a, a good example is what's happening with birth control right now. You know, who would have thought, you know, that at this, at this uh, time in history we would be fighting the birth control battle all over again almost. But, you know, aside from that, which is a more political issue, I think that even in terms of societies, there's many societies, professional scientific societies, that are completely male dominated and where you do get those sorts of attitudes. And I didn't talk about, you know, the, the predator uh, aspect of um, some professional societies where women are seen as, oh, you know, nice young sweet woman, well, gee, it's a good sex partner. And that's the way that they will operate. And it's really quite shocking when people are, find themselves in those sorts of situations. But unfortunately, they can still occur. And I think what you talked about is a good example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I know. I don't know him personally. I know of him. Why? Just curious? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, not really, because, I mean, I think what has happened with Michael Fox is that he has sort of left animal behavior um, and sort of gone more into the, you know, animal rights end of things. And so I really have, and that's part of the reason I haven't had much contact with him. Um, he, he left, he was at Washington University, and he left Washington University at roughly the same time that I arrived. Uh, in St. Louis. And so we didn't really overlap that much. From what I had heard of him, I think we probably would agree on a lot of things. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I came to Amsol in 76. So, yeah. So he, I guess he actually left before I got here. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, from, from some of the things I've heard about him when he was doing animal behavior, I probably, we probably would have shared a lot of perspectives. Yeah, Margaret. Well, actually, that's a really interesting question. You know, my experience, and again, this is completely based just on the Animal Behavior Society, is that oftentimes it was the among the Americans, it was the younger men who were more likely to be sexist. And that's like the example that I gave where the, the elders, if you want, elder men of the society pulled the student aside and said, that's not acceptable. You know, I think it's an example of that. So, but, but that was a while ago. You know, and things have changed so, so much that I don't even see that as an issue. I think that what remains an issue in the animal behavior society is the uh, number of women fellows. And so, for example, um, there's fewer women fellows than you would expect from the membership. And some people will say, well, that's because we're still catching up. And one of the people that I put up there, Lee Drickamer, in the, slide of the second slide with the men on it, um, gave a keynote. Uh, it was actually a fellows lecture uh, a couple of years ago, and he excoriated the society leadership for not having more women fellows. Uh, and also for, I mentioned that Gene Altman has just received the Distinguished Animal Behaviorist Award, which is the highest award given by the society, that there are not more women who have received that award. Um, and so, and, and when I said that there's still areas that need improvement, that's what I was thinking of. But you have people who, are men, you know, like Lee Drickman, for example, who are very actively saying, you know, this has got to change, this is shameful, and we shouldn't have this, and yeah, we're a great society, but this is not acceptable, so, yeah. Well, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, but thank you very, very much for coming.
I know that many of my students are slogging away on their midterm exam. There are a few here, which is very nice. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so, thank you.